Uh, thank you everyone for, for attending this th uh, session of Global Thoughts. I'd like to welcome Martin Tillman. He's the president of Global Career Compass and he is an affiliate of the Gateway International Group. And we've known each other for a couple of years now and, and we've often talked about the connection between education abroad and career development. And so I think we're gonna, it's, uh, the time is propitious to examine that, especially as we technically are exiting or extricating ourselves from this pandemic. I think it's good to see that. Um, so uh, Martin has been, I think you've been in the field for over, over 40 years, correct? So we, we have- that's, uh, that's right. So we have a veteran presence here and I think uh, we could definitely use uh, benefit from your advice. Uh, before we get started, I just wanna let everyone know that we are recording this. I think you've done these Zoom sessions before. Please stay on mute. You're welcome to send any uh, any uh, questions to Marty via chat. But if you you know me, this is a very flexible format. So if you do have a question for Marty, certainly you can ask at any time. Uh, we want the important thing is we have this conversation, and there we don't want to leave any questions out. Okay. So I am going to get the ball rolling. Um, by asking uh, Marty a quick question. So we have education abroad and then career development and employability. So what, what is that connection? Well, I'm gonna expand on it a little bit as I get uh, into uh, the body of my remarks, but uh, they, what I have started um, about 18 years ago to, to uh, frame uh, was in the narrative that there was a way for undergraduate students to who had international experience uh, to benefit from that experience in ways that would help them uh, in framing why they were can good sufficiently uh, prepared candidates for jobs when they graduated. I mean, in the past years, those of us who are on this call now, who, who have been in the field a while, understand that it, it used to be sufficient, even in the way uh, study abroad was marketed, um, was that you'd had smiling students uh, in, in tour visiting tourist sites abroad, uh, questions like would be in, in surveys, um, they would say, students would be saying, uh, I thought my experience was great. Um, we had a fantastic time, we saw many places. And the, that kind of, uh, those anecdotal remarks were never in, in for a long time never really seriously questioned. Uh, however, um, there was a moment in time when I think the field uh, and campus administrators realized that that was um, a, a very um, unhelpful way for students to um, use the experience that they had, the privilege that they had by going abroad. And it was always a privileged group of students. You know, we all know. Three, four hundred thousand students a year out of 20 million in the United States have the opportunity to be educated abroad at, for any number of months or weeks. Um, most students did not have that experience. Um, and so what I sought have sought to do is to change that narr narrative a bit um, to look at. And I started following when Twitter came around. I was able to um, readily follow um, researchers. Um, uh, in the EU, um, in North America, uh, in the Asia Pacific area, particularly in Australia. Um, and I've had a, a, a cluster of colleagues, all of whom have been involved with research work. And then I started writing and publishing uh, and examining the evidence, co authoring books with several colleagues, uh, and which tried to look at. What, it's not on the student. What I have attempted to uh, frame it is it's not the student themselves uh, that is that for them to make, it's not on them to make this connection per se. But what uh, for me uh, was important is to help academic institutions and engage with uh, uh, providers as well uh, to develop um, a framework so that students prior to the decision to go abroad understood that this was not, this was going to have, they would go, obviously going to have a good time, it would be a fun experience, but that it was a deeper way for them to make meaning of this experience and their academic goals and as well as their professional aspirations. And it was on the campus, it was on the campus to put that 
together. Uh, what some of us have called uh, a career integration model on a campus. Um, uh, when student chooses to uh, go abroad, it's not merely walking into a, uh, the international office after being at a study abroad fair, saying, I'd like to go to Italy. And then they get it, uh, they get the information necessary instrumentally, you know, here, here are the visa requirements for you. Um, here are the academic, here are the other administrative issues you have to um, be aware of. Here's the, here's the, the financing for that experience and so forth. And then off you go. Um, so uh, I think the other, uh, why don't we move on in the slide to number two. Right. So uh, employers have e increasing, I'm going to jump into the body of my remarks. Um, it'll so that uh, what I have to say will make a little more sense. As employers have become increasingly active partners uh, with campuses to structure mobile internships pre pandemic, pre pandemic, and since 2019, in co creating uh, virtual study abroad and internship programs, researchers have consistently found evidence that while employers value many skills and competencies gained through these experiences, it's not enough for students to just showcase those experiences. Students have lacked the skills to articulate what they learned while abroad to effectively distinguish themselves from other job candidates. And that, uh, in, in that's what we mean by employability. Um, it's not what some have critiqued this whole narrative that I've talked about for years as being a, a kind of vocationalization of international education. That is not at all uh, what this is about. But it is about helping having uh, tools to help students understand how to make um, meaning of their experience in a way which would add great value to whatever their professional aspirations or vocational goals might be. Um, and so among the things that students need to understand from an employer's point of view are what you see here. Employers seeking talent with field, uh, students who have field specific knowledge, a broader range of skills, more, they're more likely to employ candidates who've worked with people from different backgrounds. Employers, in research terms, th there's evidence, strong evidence that employers actually value students coming to them with internships as opposed to merely, as I say, merely studying abroad in the classroom. Why? Because practicality, the applied skills that are uh, obtained by internships are readily important to um, most employers. And I don't mean just from, a, you know, in the in the business community here, it, this, we're talking nonprofit work, international organizations, any field of work. Now, the last point is, is um, a point of contention, perhaps. Research has shown that employers are less optimistic than students about their preparedness. And that means, too, employers tend to be less optimistic than their academic colleagues are about the career readiness of the students that are going out of college looking for work. And so where we are now is that uh, rising tuition, the tight labor market, COVID, and the increasingly diverse backgrounds of students enrolled at both two and four year institutions require realigning at abroad learning outcomes to achieve the gains that I've just discussed in both applied skills and broader intercultural competencies. Um, and what I've argued is that this realignment is necessary to effectively assist students in their career development and postgraduate job searches. And importantly, to do anything less denies the reality facing students and their families, and particularly so as campuses have become much more diverse, as the pool of students uh, that enter and graduate are far, far more diverse than they were um, five, 10 years ago, for sure. Now, um, if you go to slide, the next slide three, um, thanks. Research has still found a disconnect in terms of diverging expectations of students and employers when it comes to linking international experience to employability. And here it is. Again, on campuses where there's no effort to really discuss the issues here with students and just 
instrumentally get them out of, give them a visa and let them go. Students are really not necessarily aware that their abroad experience is going to or has the potential to impact their employability when they graduate. And then the other side of this coin, employers expect academic institutions to make this connection for their students. Um, it's not going to be on the employer. So where that leads us is that the uneven economic recovery that we're going through here in the US and in many other nations, for sure, along with persistent questions about the value of a college degree that is it's come to the fore very recently among some sectors of our public is going to slow the return to some new normal state of international education. The tremendous disruption in the campus workforce in the past two years remains a problem at all levels from young professionals with one to five years of experience to senior administrators. Um, I've been involved with NASA in uh, on this issue. Um, and we know that uh, um, perhaps the numbers that were reported were an undercount, but in, certainly in the first year of the pandemic, um, the, the job losses uh, were, were, were enormous. And as far as I can understand the situation, there are still many campuses that have not rehired, many organizations not fully uh, staffed back up uh, to their pre-pandemic levels. And a good indicator of that is NAFSA itself here in Washington, uh, which has um, let go almost 50% of their staff. So campuses have been pushed by the pandemic and economic forces to reassess their strategic approach to internationalization of their curriculum and co-curriculum in relation to their broader internationalization goals. I mean, for example, um, I, I know of instances where because of the fiscal distress on a campus, say they've lost, they've fired staff, closed their international program office, and thus basically took away the major uh, effort on their campus uh, to uh, internationalize their community. To regain the momentum that we've lost the last two and a half years or so is that some of the following ideas might um, come back into play uh, and become a reality again. That is the cross-training of staff in both career service offices and at abroad offices, engaging with faculty to dialogue about the value of linking employability with student international experiences, directly engaging employers to assess their talent needs and seek their view of career readiness of students. And that's no, there's no better way to understand the situation that students face when employers are confused about how to judge the value of international experience um, than to hear that directly from an employer. Develop a campus-wide career integration strategy to help students make informed decisions about the type of ed abroad or at home experience that students seek to support their career aspirations. And a final question here I would pose is, has the pause in student mobility changed employer perspectives of the value of international experience? And my answer is, I don't think so. However, I do think my own earlier optimism about the linkage that I've been known to write about and talk about um, has been tempered by research in the last few years. Um, that's true in the two book chapters that I recently co-authored in 20 and 21. Um, in those chapters, in summary, um, we agreed employers are equivocal now about the value of learning abroad. And we stated in one uh, chapter, the relationship between ed abroad and employability is mixed and sometimes overstated. And I'm willing to take uh, responsibility on that last point to say, I may have overstated um, uh, that that link. And uh, the, re the, the reality of that is, is uh, less clear. But it isn't that global globalization has become less a factor or that we ought to place less emphasis on preparing global ready grads, nor would I suggest widening opportunities for more students to gain international experience is any less important than it was three years ago. Rather, I think the field, and this is kind of my summary point uh, for you all, 
uh, I think our field needs to place less emphasis on the instrumental administrative elements of sending students abroad. Doesn't this make sense given the layoffs in international offices? Doesn't it make sense given the narrowing of destinations outside Europe due to COVID? And doesn't it make sense to develop alternative models and reallocate scarce resources to deliver benefits of an abroad experience in a more inclusive way to more diverse groups of students? And in that regard, uh, we all are, and you all are very aware um, in your work about the rapid adoption of virtual learning uh, due to the early lockdown. It filled the void when mobility was for the first time since study abroad programs came into being. And that's the remarkable point. The very first time that we've seen a complete shutdown of that opportunity was only three years ago, since the very first study abroad program came into being after World War II. So now I think that virtual ed abroad and virtual opportunities here at home has shown a potential to finally close the accessibility gap, which has systemically prevented international experience from being available to all students. So I think that is the thin silver lining that's emerged in the past three years. And we know we need to now do as much research and analysis devoted to assessing success of virtual programs as we have focused on mobile international programs for many decades. And so that research is going to help uh, I think, uh, uh, better uh, guide um, how, how the resource allocation made uh, to virtual opportunities uh, by campuses and um, going forward. So I'm going to really stop here, uh, hear from you guys, uh, talk to each other, ask me questions, and uh, let's see where we are. Well, thank you very much, <clears throat> Marty. That's a, a wonderful discussion. I mean, it's certainly very timely. It's very necessary. Uh, and thanks for everyone uh, for being here. So let's see, uh, does anyone have any questions? Let's see. Well, I'm more than open. Uh, I'm more nope. than open to anyone who disagrees with anything that I've said. Let's hear from you. Hi, I'm Marty. I was looking to try to see how I could raise my hand. Can I just speak up? Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. I think I told you before, I, I, I've i wondered if there's a disconnect between what employers say they value, which is, they, so on surveys, they'd say they value um, study abroad and, and those experiences, and then what they what they invest in, what they hire for. Um, so my uh, theory had been that all things being equal, they'll take um, the person who might have study abroad experience because that shows softer skills, uh, cross-cultural communication, um, problem solving and so forth. But they're not gonna put a premium, premium on that over other, other things, including, you know, prestige uh, university or other experience. So that that's sort of my theory. And especially as we've had this pause as study abroad has gotten shorter and, and perhaps less, uh, you know, perhaps more uh, with faculty as opposed to, you know, a student on their own for longer periods of time in a different language. And now perhaps with even less abroad experience, if we're talking about uh, virtual exchange, how do you see that changing or, 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 do, you, or do you see that changing um, in the future? It's, a, it's really, uh, I really appreciate um, what you said, uh, Chris. Um, I hope everybody heard that. Um, yeah, I, I, the 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 uh, the evidence, the research, you know, about in, what employers value is all over the place, quite honestly. And uh, there are going back uh, to the British Council put out a piece in 2013 that has always been pointed to, even though it's now almost 10 years ago. Um, that what surprises that the things that international educators that we would like to see 
being valued from in our international, all the effort and resource we put into sending students abroad is, is not, as you say, it's not always top of the list. So language skills, for example, um, intercultural competence, for example, not necessarily fall at the top of a particular employer's list. But this is the thing, you know, um, this is exactly why this conundrum, Chris, is why I think there needs to just be a greater effort at um, integrating career uh, development into as a part of the whole way in which campuses design their abroad programs. So it's not enough to just pick a country, pick a region, uh, you know, develop partnerships on, you know, on the ground and so forth, and then have students go for it. I mean, if a student is seeking a particular line of work through and it's connect and uh, they want to be helped to align the choice they make for their abroad experience to complement their academic work and their major and then and the um, internships they might have already uh, accrued at, at in their home community or in their state and put all that together so that it makes the most sense when they go job to job seek so if a student has an interest you know, in the health field, in international health, let's just say, um, they're, they're majoring in uh, public health. Um, you know, obviously, if all these pieces fall together clearly on uh, when they go in to discuss where to go abroad or what type of program is most suitable for them, then that particular student is going to get great value from up at that particular international opportunity, right? I think the problem has been for so long that there was never any attention, usually never any attention paid to putting all these pieces of the puzzle together prior to a student's going abroad. It's always been the, the approach has been, let's help students, let's help administrators get the instrumental skills together they need in order to have students have a safe international experience. And then we're done. You know, then we've fulfilled our obligations uh, for internationalizing our campus, if you will. I mean, I think it was backwards. That's that's the point. So I, I appreciate what you said, Chris, and I, I don't disagree with you. Thank you. Any other questions? Well, I think I'll ask, I have another question for you, Marty. Um, yeah. I've been in, in a few discussions now where people are saying that for internships, especially in international education, that the interns should be paid. And there's some other people who are saying, well, no, this is an opportunity for them. And they should be thankful for the opportunity for them to network, to develop professionally, especially in international education, uh, et cetera. Uh, how do you view it? Should they, should they be paid or should we just continue with what has always been done? No, I no. For me, but that's it. Okay, thanks, Tom. I I think there. Look, um, this whole issue is tied to the reexamination of privilege. I think throughout our our society, um, and on campus, um, for too long, that question was never on the table. It was just let's get an internship uh, program together. No one at was at necessarily concerned that, hey. Is this uh, unpaid? Uh, these are these unpaid opportunities going to be of equal of value to all of our students? So that question wasn't always there. I think now it's front and center. So um, you know, low-income minority students are going to be looking to get paid for internships because their families need to know that if their students are not in the classroom, they're earning some income somewhere. Um, just that in the same way that the families of these students are going to be uh, very, very concerned about the cost of any education abroad experience that takes them away from being in the classroom too and asking different kinds of questions than uh, students from more privileged families, uh, students who uh, you know, have had um, internships in high school, if you will. Uh, so yeah, that's the way I would see this. Okay, thank you. But I'd be interested in how some of my friends on the call now uh, view it from their campus points of view. Hi, Kate. <laughs> Hi, Marty. I was actually gonna say, um, 
that brings up a whole lot of visa paperwork issues as well. Like to have a student get paid in a foreign country. I mean, some companies well, can't do that. Uh, some students can't even navigate getting a, a, a student visa, let alone a work visa. So that just complicates things a lot. Does that mean, Kate, that to follow your point um, to its conclusion, I mean, so would that mean that a low income uh, student would be very much less likely to 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 even examine the that kind of opportunity for them it's unless possible. the campus had some way yeah unless the campus had some way of subsidizing it for example i think the uk for the tier four visa to do like an internship even if it's not paid is at least 500 us dollars and a lot of paperwork huh. so that has made many of my students not want to do like an internship component when they were doing their exchange at York or wherever. So that's, yeah. And for a one person office, I can't advise students on how to get visa paperwork for work visas. So as much as I'd love to pay students, I don't think it's possible, at least not right now. Yeah, great. Anybody else want to chime in on that? I just say it's a it's an incredibly important point, Marty, and um, thanks for raising it. For you know, we we finally started addressing it with domestic internships and and recognizing the the privilege that comes with being able to accept an unpaid internship and the, the um, advantages that brings internationally it it's those issues still exist but the greater issue of affordability and accessibility and and privilege that comes with that is 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 equally there so i think it's even more important to to make sure we think about addressing it whether or not I think as Kate mentions, it's possible to do it with international internships, but to continue to think about equity and how to how to ensure it as we as we move forward. It's it's um I think it's one of the most important uh, topics for education abroad moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, Marty, uh, this is Carrie. Hey, Carrie. Way back when, when I was on a campus, the question was more of an academic one in which the campus said that you could not earn credit and be paid uh -huh. in the experience for which you were earning credit. It didn't matter whether it was domestic or international at that point. I don't, I don't know if that has changed within the whole realm of internships in that thinking but it, it does open up another can of worms and uh, when we start looking at credit bearing activities. Right, that's, Terry, it's great you said that. I mean, because it, it, it that, um, back in our day, so, you know, that's just indicative of the fact that say the faculty um, were not much in touch with the questions of diversity equity that we're talking about right now. Um, as being front and center, maybe it was never raised, no one cared, right? I mean, that, that just wasn't a concern, I think. I, I agree. Diversity and equity was certainly not on the table in those days. Uh, it was more a uh, academic philosophy issue. <laughs> yeah. There are, I'd be interested to hear from a few others on the call who are on campuses now. Do you see it differently um, where you are? Hi, y'all. Hi, Marty. Can you guys hear me okay? Uh, yes. Oh, great. Um, thank you for this. It was really, really interesting. I work at a small private college here outside of Albany, New York. And one thing I'll say, um, 
I agree, Marty. I think that uh, I probably too have probably like inflated the value <laughs> of study abroad to employers, to students, you know, as a way of convincing and encouraging students to go to see study abroad as more than just you know, a semester or a few weeks having fun in another country, which is, I think, the way it's been seen as kind of just this add on, not an academic, not necessarily an academic endeavor over the years. One thing I know that we struggle with um, when it comes to programs where they are hyper focused on employer, you know, uh, internships, employability, skills for employers is um, a real uh, tightening of the curriculum. So it's harder and harder for students to go because we have more and more tracks within majors. The requirements are becoming more and more um, strict and the, the room to study abroad, we send most of our semesters abroad, for, uh, students abroad for a semester. The room for study abroad um, is kind of shrinking and shrinking, which means short-term programs are becoming more and more common just for kind of general core coursework. Um, but that, you know, fitting in a semester abroad where it is more focused on career skills or you know that internship or things like that become harder and harder for our students um so i think we're we're fighting uh you know kind of fighting things on multiple fronts here in terms of being able to have programs that would really benefit students um in terms of employability versus this student has to go to london because they have to take these three economics or business courses to stay on track academically Mm. Well, yeah, thanks, uh, Abigail. Uh, you know, and how do you how do you view in the context you were just just talking about it on your campus? How what what about the role of faculty in make um, uh, are they part of the, this dialogue that we're we're having right here? I mean, are your faculty seeing their role um, any differently? I don't think so. You know, we have a, some core faculty who are very supportive of study abroad, but I will say um, one of the frustrations I think we have is that when decisions are made about the curriculum, so new majors or new tracks within majors, um, while there's a checkbox on the form that says they've you know, convened with other offices that these decisions might impact, um, our office is clearly impacted by curriculum decisions and changes. Um, most of the time we have not been you know, communicated with about it or consulted about it to say, hey, what does this do, you know, to students going abroad? Um, so it's definitely something that we have to address um, as as things continue to continue to change. Um, our School of Business actually did just make a change this past fall, um, beginning this fall, that all their students have to have some kind of experiential learning component which is great. That would include study abroad, internships, and things like that. Um, but again, uh, we weren't, we love that, but we weren't necessarily consulted about it and what that might mean in terms of is any study abroad experience applicable? Does it have to have an internship? Um, is a three-week program considered, uh, you know, this experiential education to them, uh, you know, even if it's not a business course? So there's a lot of, I think, details that weren't necessarily consulted with um, when it comes to making these decisions in the curriculum, for sure. And one last point, Abigail, I would put to you, if you don't mind, uh, in the last, well, since COVID emerged, Right. I mean, have you found and once you came back together and your campus so reopened, have you found any um, greater nuance, if you will, in how everyone is addressing internationalization uh, issues, broadly speaking? I haven't seen it myself. Um, you know, we're a bit siloed here in which I interact with some faculty who run faculty led programming, which is usually a travel course where they travel for about a week um, together as a group. Um, there's been a lot of heightened interest in that more and more faculty becoming interested in running these courses. Um, and our study abroad numbers have gone up, you know, are going up very rapidly right now, kind of to pre pandemic numbers. Um, but I'm not sure I'm hearing anything in terms of like, you know, clearly we've seen, you know, a global, you know, pandemic happen. This is why globalization and internationalization is important. Um, 
I, I haven't heard that, but then again, I'm not on the classroom side. So the conversations that are happening, I might just not be involved with, if that makes sense. Okay, thanks. Any other questions? I'm just going to do, um, go to the next slide here, and you can see this um, other ways to connect with Marty. I'll be sending this um, this PowerPoint to everyone, so don't worry about copying these things down. There, there are links. You can connect with him through LinkedIn, Twitter, email, and you can see what the work that he does with the Global Career Compass. And of course, one of his uh, no, numerous articles that he's written, as you can see, he's he is a good thought leader on this topic. Uh, I'm going to embarrass Abby a little bit and do some shameless self-promotion, but we we edited a book recently called Mid-Career Professionals in International Education, which is precisely uh, to, to be shared with human resource departments on campus so that people can understand that international educators do bring a very important uh, skill set to campus and to spread the word. It's uh, it's free. It's downloadable on the, on the forum's website, and I'll send this link out to everyone after... Um, certainly after the presentation. I totally oh. just put it in the chat. Uh, okay. Shameless so, plugging. So thanks, Abby, I appreciate it. Thank you. I, I can't multitask, so that's uh, I, I appreciate it. But again, I think we can all agree that this is you know, people on campus, uh, certainly human resource departments, you know, career services. This is a valuable resource. It, it shows, one, the, the diversity of our field, of the people who enter into the field. They come from a, 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 an array of backgrounds, which was wonderful. And then you know, their journey and how they entered the field. And then the, the, the best part for me was the advice that they have for newcomers to the field, whether they're young college graduates or someone who's transitioning from another career into international education. Uh, we really do hope people will, will share it with as many people as possible. We hope you will share it and just discuss it and just see, I think you know, we, we touch upon what is so special about the, the work that we do in the field that we work in. Uh, so thank you, Abby, for um, uh, for posting that because I can't do two things at once. <laughs> uh, but I will send this PowerPoint so you can all connect with Marty. You can see the work that he's done. Uh, and then uh, if there are no other questions, I just want to let you know that we do have another, our next Global Thoughts uh, speaker is going to be Mark Snesh. He's from Geoversity. We have partnered to offer a program for faculty uh, development in Panama uh, to encourage faculty to consider developing their own short-term programs abroad. So this is something he'll be joining us on October 20th at 11 a.m. Uh, let me know if you're interested. Uh, I think he has a lot uh, on his mind. I, I'm, I'm, I always have a lot of time, a lot of uh, fun talking with him. Uh, it, it should be a good, a good session. And I think it, it, uh, that will be it. If there are any, uh, if there are no other questions. Um, I'd like to thank. Um, oh, I'm sorry, Marty. Go ahead. A last point I would make to whoever's left on the call is just quickly at NAFSA um, in Denver last spring, we had uh, 6,000 participants and 40%, 40% of that number were first timers, first timers. Um, and I, I've been thinking a lot. I haven't, I haven't get it, gotten it out of my head that that's a huge number of young professionals who perhaps have just made a decision uh to you know get involved with our work and the challenge to everyone on campus with provider organizations how are you going to retain their interest in this uh, vocation right uh in in what we do for the long term because 40 percent of six thousand is a huge number if that if 20 percent if 25 20 30 percent i mean don't show up again in a year or two that turnover is really going to have an impact on sustainability of, of programming uh, on campuses and with organizations, this constant need for marketing, recruiting, talent searching, all of that business is going to take away momentum. So I'm really quite concerned about that. And I just think everything we've just addressed for a little uh, salon, if you will, here this morning, uh, um, you know, uh, all these points will remain critical, I think, in the long term uh, to keep the interest of young talent, right, to see the field we're talking about um, as a, a vibrant uh, one, uh, ch which is challenging to young undergrads and uh, offers tremendous opportunities for professional growth at the same time, you know, 
So I, I'm, I'd be interesting to see, uh, maybe I'll see some of you here in DC next spring at the NAFSA, the big NAFSA meeting, which is 75th anniversary of, uh, of NAFSA here in DC. So thank you for being on the call. And thanks Tom for the opportunity. Well, thank you, uh, Marty, for uh, for delivering such a great um, great presentation, very thoughtful, and again, very timely. And thank you, everyone, for joining us. Your questions were excellent. And just as a reminder, this conversation does not end here. We hope this will keep on going, that you will be sharing this with other colleagues, and that the field as a whole will will uh, keep this on on their uh, on their plate. It, it, it is very important. So thank you very much, everyone. Uh, I appreciate it. Again, Marty, thank you. And we'll do this again sometime. Thanks.